the money. Oh, All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, we kind of left off last class talking about key values and thinking about how we do this hypothesis testing. So, we started out with something like the null and alternative. We said the alternative hypothesis what we're trying to test for. Right? This might be something like that the mean is less than seven. And then so we assume the opposite is true, kind of like a court case. We stack the deck against ourselves, so we assume that it's instead greater than or equal to seven. This value that we've assumed that population parameter is equal to, or, or kind of greater than or equal to, we kind of call that mu zero, or kind of like Whatever the statistic is, use kind of a zero subscript to represent it's the null. If that's the case, we said then what should be true is that the sample means should be normally distributed around that value. If what we assume to be true is in fact true, right? So even though we've said it's greater than or equal to, we'll use kind of that last cutoff point as our assumed true mean. And if we can reject the value of seven with our sample mean, the only way that's going to happen is if we see a sample mean that's somewhere down like below seven. Right? So if we're able to reject seven as a true mean value, we could reject anything above seven as well. Right? Because if it's so unlikely that what we assume to be true is in fact true based off of our sample mean, well, if I can reject seven as the true value, I can reject anything above it as well. So once we have our sample mean, what we'll do is create, uh, let's call it Z, kind of our Z stat or our test statistic, our Z statistic. Test statistics is kind of like an overarching term. Z statistics just kind of references that we come from the standard normal distribution. So what we'll do is we'll take that sample mean value We'll treat the assumed true mean as though it is, in fact, the population mean. And then we'll divide by what we know the standard deviation of those sample means should be. Now, going back to a scenario where we kind of we had to be given what that population variance is, it's kind of a weird scenario, but we have to kind of walk before we run so we understand this before we kind of move towards the skewed skew distribution. Similar to the confidence interval, what we do with confidence. So I'll turn this into a, a Z value. Okay. So this is my Z stat. I can then find the probability that I saw this sample mean or anything further from that assumed true mean. And what that probability will represent, we're going to call that the Z value. Now, this is for a left tail test. We then talked about the right tail test, it's everything but on the right hand side for a two tail test. And so the only difference is we'll have this area, but it really only represents half of my p value because it would have been equally as likely for me to see something that went against the null on the other side of the distribution. Because for a two tail test, we're doing something like assuming that it's not equal to zero, exactly equal to one specific value. So there, seeing sample means on either side of the distribution would go against the null. For left tail test, just this area in the left. We then said if that p value gets below our specified alpha, then we're okay rejecting it. So basically, I might just do something like set alpha to be 0 0.05 and say, look, if the probability of seeing this sample mean, if in fact what I assume to be true was true, falls below 5%, then it's I'm okay rejecting this value as a true mean because it's not likely that I saw the sample mean value I did if that was in fact the true mean. And what's probably more likely to be true if that probability falls below 0.5 is that the actual distribution of my sample means is probably centered around a much lower population mean, something much lower than that seven that I was assuming. Is that makes sense? 
we'll work through some problems here in a little bit. I'm still kind of trying to build the concepts here. So one thing that we can start to do, similar to confidence intervals, is you know sometimes when I build my confidence interval, I ended up with one of those sample means that was like didn't include the true population mean, right? I was like wrong 5% of the time at the 95% confidence interval. Same kind of thing is going to happen with hypothesis testing. I'll be right a certain percentage of the time, but I'm also going to be making some errors. Right? So let's think about if this was. So we're going to get rid of this. If in fact that assumed true mean value of seven was in fact the true mean, let's like live in that world for a second. So I assume something was true. I ended up being exactly right. Okay. Well, then I could still see sample means that are down here that end up having really low p values, and I reject that norm. But I just happen to see a sample mean that wasn't very likely. So I will still be rejecting, even though, in fact, that true population mean was, or that assumption was, in fact, true. So there will be. All the values that are down here that would have p values less than 0 0.05, I would reject the null when in fact I shouldn't have been. Right? So, what we call that is a type one error. So, what proportion of type one errors am I going to make? Well, right, whatever I set that alpha at, right? Because wherever I'm setting alpha, you can kind of think about it as when I set alpha, what I'm essentially doing is saying, This area in the tail down here, any value of the sample mean that's in this range will give me a p value that's less than alpha. Right? So for all these values, I would be making an incorrect decision on the hypothesis test. But I'm okay with that because seeing these values is a very unlikely, right? If what I assume to be true was in fact. So type one errors are going to be when we reject the null, even though we shouldn't have been, right? When we see these sample means that just weren't very likely for us to see, so we reject it. But in fact, what we assume to be true ends up actually being true. So we'll be making type one errors, whatever alpha, right, uh, sorry, the probability of type one errors we'll be making is whatever value alpha would be. So type two errors would be if we failed to reject the null, even though we should have been. So this one's a little bit less likely. Uh, I can try to give you an idea behind this one. I think I'll draw another, another graph for you. So type two errors are going to be when I reject the null, or sorry, when I fail to reject the null, even though I should have. So let's say we've got our assumed true mean here. We'll say it's using that value of seven. So let's say I see a sample mean I don't know. I'll just say six just to have me use integers here. I end up determining the you know the p value or I turn this into a, a z statistic, find the probability that I saw something this far away from what I assume to be true or even further. And that p that you know the p value would be relatively large. So my p-value is not going to end up being less than my kind of typical alphas. Typical alphas we set are relatively low. It's similar to confidence intervals, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, corresponding to the 99, 95, 90% 90 confidence levels. So my p-value is going to be too big. I'm, I'm going to fail to reject, right? Because I only reject that p-value is less than the alpha I set. So I failed to reject, but... Down the road, I'm able to figure out what the true mean is. So this was my assumption. Down the road, I get population data, and I see that the true mean was, in fact, something like maybe three. So I failed to reject seven as the true population mean, even though I should have been, because the true mean was much, much lower. Right? It's just that the sample mean value I found happened to be 
in this kind of upper right tail of the actual like correct distribution. But I wasn't able to like observe this ahead of time, right? But if I was, I wouldn't have to do this hypothesis test, right? But after the fact, if I am able to get population data, potentially I have a scenario like this where I'm making a type two error. Does that kind of kind of make sense there? It's just, I know it's still kind of early, but uh, we kind of have you know those the other other combinations would be when I'm making the correct decision, right? So when the null actually is true and I fail to reject it, that's those things line up. When the null ends up being false and I reject it, those things you know I'm making the correct decision. And then the other combinations were type one, type two error. Type one was I reject it even though I should have been. Type two is I failed to reject it even though I. I should have. So, again, I've already mentioned this, but that type one error is going to be exactly whatever alpha is, right? So we're okay with kind of kind of making this percent of errors, or I guess alpha is the probability. We can turn that into a percent by just moving a decimal. So I'm okay making errors with you know a probability of 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 uh, or 0.1. It's kind of a benchmark kind of values we'll set there. Uh, I think I, I kind of punt on this and I don't know if we can take more statistics. You would talk a little bit more about type two error. It, it's basically a function of your type one error. So as your type one error goes, uh, I say if my type one error goes up, that actually reduces my type two error. So they're kind of inversely related. Um, we won't really focus on type two errors a lot in this class. So for us, we're really just going to focus on that type one error or kind of use that, that alpha value. But if you kind of, you know, if you like stats and you want to keep taking them, you probably learn a lot more about type two error, especially in the medical field. So you can kind of imagine like, uh, it, and a lot of things in life, I, I, I want to, it's not as big of a deal if I reject something being true and then it ends up being true. So like type one errors, like I'm um, kind of, I don't know, usually I want to, I want to, um, I want to, what am I looking for? Um, <laughs> I'm blanking. So I want to like um, err on the side of caution, right? So like in the medical field, type two errors are a lot more important because that's where I'm failing to reject something. Well, if like I'm failing to reject that somebody is healthy, but then they end up actually being sick, like that's, very costly, <laughs> right? At least like in, in the business world, kind of our decisions when we're making type two errors aren't necessarily as costly, so we just don't focus on those. Uh, but like in the, in the medical field, type two errors are, well, errors are a lot more important. So one way to kind of remember, I was kind of like this example, I think I stole some book, but type one error, like if I assume or my null hypothesis is that someone's not pregnant, I then kind of you know, we're going to test to see whether or not they are, and then make a you know, decision about that hypothesis test. Type one error would be something like this, right? Where you're saying, you know, I'm rejecting that null hypothesis when very clearly I'm wrong. Right? Type two error would be when I fail to reject, when I'm failing to reject the null hypothesis, even though very clearly I should have. Okay? So, type one, type two errors. Um, I think we went through uh, here. I have the type two errors, RA, kind of, um, yeah, there type two errors are kind of the inverse relationship to type one errors. I think I've already said everything here. We kind of usually set these benchmark alpha values similar to confidence intervals. Um, I've talked about the interpretation of what we're really doing is saying that we're okay being wrong alpha times 100% of the time, right? I'll move that decimal point two places. Uh, type two error, we'll kind of punt on this. Like I said, it's inversely related. Um, we can do things like increase the sample size, but we're not going to focus on this. So I'll kind of skip this class. So I think we went through, how, where did we leave off at? So we started working through this problem. And I believe we got all the way to, we showed you these. Show you this, and I think this is kind of where we stop, right? So here's our, our all of our steps, right? And maybe we did work through the next problem, but I'll kind of rework it just so that we get more practice. So we first figure out what the normal term hypothesis are. We then have to set whatever, whatever type one error we're okay with making or alpha. 
We calculate our Z statistic. Using the Z statistic, we can go to the standard normal table, find the p-value or the probability that we saw the sample mean we did or anything further from the assumed true mean. Once I have that p-value, I compare it to alpha. If it's less than alpha, right, for this threshold I've set, then I reject the null. If it's not, then I say I failed to reject the null. I didn't find evidence that was inconsistent enough with what I assumed to be true to reject it. So we had this example where I was kind of assuming that the average mass mark of beer is greater than or equal to 7% because what I wanted to test for is the water adds less than 7 So whatever I want to test for is my alternative hypothesis. We sometimes say then whatever I want to test against right, would be my null. So what you want to test for is your alternative hypothesis. What you want to test against is your null. So we have these different types of tests. We so said we have sort of a left, a right, or a two-tailed test. So here I've got a left-tailed test. So what I'm going to do is think about, I'm trying to turn that 4.5 into a Z-stat. So I just start plugging things in, right? The sample mean I found was 4.5. The assumed true mean is 7. I think I gave the population variance here was one, and the sample size is 36. So I plug all those things in. I would be able to calculate what this Z stat is. So if we do that, we get what negative 15 here. I don't even have to look up my table, right? What's the probability of seeing a Z value of negative 15 or anything to the left? Pretty much zero, right? And we're looking at standard normal table, it only goes out to negative four, right? The area to the left is negative four, out to the fourth decimal looks like zero. Right? So this is going to be essentially a p value of approximately zero. So if I'm getting a p value of approximately zero, is that going to be less than alpha? I don't even remember what alpha I specified. Is it 0.05? Well, it doesn't matter. If my p value is approximately zero, I can reject that. I can reject like the 99.999%. So this one is the example of I find a sample mean that's very inconsistent with what I assume to be true, then I could end up with these wildly large Z statistics, which then lead to kind of these P values that are really close to zero. And that intuitively makes sense. If I find sample evidence that's very inconsistent with what I assume to be true, then I should be rejecting the mean. I should, should be rejecting that assumption, right? And sure enough, that leads to if I find sample evidence that's really inconsistent with what I assume to be true, you know, 4.5 instead of 7, especially when I've got like a really low population variance to begin with, population variance equals 1, right? Then I have this really low p-value, which will definitely be less than any alpha I want to look at, and I can reject it. So I put critical value here. I should have said the p-value. Critical value is another approach. I don't know if we'll get there today, but for sure on, on Friday, I'll introduce you to another way we can make rejection decisions and hypothesis out. And I had some stupid memes about craft beer, but I actually like craft beer, so it's not to sell that separately. But um, so we're through another example here. So let's say I go back to this example where I had the guy, the sociologist or economist or whatever I call him, and he wants to see is the mean retirement age greater than 67? So what would my null and alternative hypothesis be here? If I want to test for whether or not the mean retirement age is greater than 67, what's my alternative hypothesis? So whatever I want to test for, so I might maybe good to kind of write this down. Whatever I'm testing for, whatever I want to find, remember that's my alternative hypothesis, and then I stack the deck against myself. So if I want to see whether or not that mean is greater than 67, what I assume is that it's less than or equal to 67, right? I stack the deck against myself from what I'm wanting to find. Any questions on that is that, so whatever I want to find, that's my alternative hypothesis. I then assume the opposite is true for my null and stack the deck against myself. So I then, so I've got this assumed true value of, 67, what is that cut off? So I know that my sample mean should be normally distributed around that if it was in fact the true population mean. I see a sample mean of 71. So what type of tailed test do I have here? 
not too tough. I'm looking at the alternative hypothesis. So I've got a greater than sign. That's my right tail test, right? Or a greater than test. So the sign in the alternative hypothesis tells me what type of test I have. So basically what this is saying is that only evidence that's greater than 67 or only evidence on the right-hand side is going to be evidence that I could possibly reject the null with. So that's why it's a right tail test. The left tail test, the only evidence that would reject the null with a left tail test is if I see evidence on the left-hand side of this review. So once I have, I think drawing the visual here always helps because now that I've got this sample mean value, all I'm gonna do is turn that into my test statistic or my Z statistic, and then find the area to the right. So right away, if I'm thinking about my p-value, which of these can I rule out? Which one? Yeah, right. Why can you rule B out? Because the area to the right of that assumed true mean should be 0.5. So if I'm seeing something that's in the right side of that distribution, the area to the right should be something much, much smaller than 0.5. So from here, you know, I can't really pick which one of these it's going to be, but I can go through the process, plug everything into that Z stat equation. And it looks really similar to what we've been using. Um, remember this denominator represents the standard deviation of our sample means. Right? So if we wanted to, we can calculate that ahead of time and just plug one value in or we can do it all at once. Uh, so I end up with about 2.22. So I go to my standard normal table. I look up on this you know, row and column headings. So 2.22 is going to be down here. Oh, no, it's going to time out on me. Maybe not, there we go. So 0.9868, right? So 0.9868, but I wanted the area to the right. The table always tells me the area to the left. So I have one more step for a right tail test, which is I have to subtract that probability I find in the table from one. So if I've got the visual, I think that, that usually that Kind of helps remind me that oh yeah I'm looking at a right tail test whatever area I find from the table that's the area the left of that Z stat I need the area to the right for a left tail test we didn't have to do that right? it kind of lines up makes it a little bit easier so at the five percent level or sorry ninety five percent confidence level do I reject or fail to reject here so we only reject the null if my p value or the probability the p value of the interpretation would be the probability I saw the sample mean that I did or anything even further from that assumed true mean, right? That's, that's what that p-value represents. The probability I saw the sample mean that I did or anything even further from that assumed true mean that goes against the null. So my p-value is 0 0.01. I compare that to say, is it below that threshold level I set? If I set the 95% confidence level, right? Five for, or uh, alpha would be 0 0.05. This p value is less than that, and so we would reject here. You see, we would say we found strong enough evidence that what we assume to be true is in fact not true. So if I can reject 67, right, why can I reject the entire null hypothesis? I just tested one value. Well, think about it. If the p value here was 0 0.01 something, for any other value, in this null hypothesis, so even if I did like, uh, if I went down to like 60, right, what has to be true, so even though we were finding the p value from our z statistic, that lines up with the area to the right of 71 when we're looking at the sample mean distribution. So if this p value is 0 0.0132, what's going to be true for every other assumed true mean that's below 67? Well, that p value is just going to get smaller and smaller. So I, if I can reject the very last value in that range, I can reject anything below it as well. If I fail to reject it, well, then all bets are off. Potentially I could like, let's say I failed to reject 67, but maybe I could reject, I don't know, 65 or 62, right? And then we have a little more work to do. But if I can reject the very last value in that range, I can for sure reject anything else below it. Question there. Anything there? 
Okay. Um, so I'm going to have you guys work through one just so I can get a little bit of feedback on how you're doing. So this one I have what? So I, I think this is a publication. The back to school spending is six hundred six dollars and forty cents. Um, the researcher thinks that it differs from this amount. We've got thirty families that found a sample mean of six hundred twenty-two eighty-five and a population mean of four thousand two hundred five. So what would my null and alternative hypothesis be here? So I'm wanting to test for whether or not the average back to school spending is different from that $606.40. So identifying the normal term hypothesis here, which one of these would be correct? So I'm wanting to test for whether or not it's different than that reported amount of $606. All right, so should be able to answer this one relatively quickly. There's not like a lot of calculations. Can I give another 15 seconds to think about this one and then we'll talk about it. All right, you haven't gotten an answer in. Let's take our best guess here. I think I counted 12, no? All right, I'm gonna close this out. Push, there we go, all right. So if I'm going to test whether it's different from six hundred six dollars which of these should be my normal term hypothesis? Yeah. yeah, so anytime we see this different than, you're just wanting to know, is it not equal to this specific value? So that's what you're wanting to test for, right? So I'm gonna say, is it not equal to this reported value? So I assume the opposite is true, which is that in fact is equal to $606. Any questions on, on that? Took a little bit of time, so I'm wondering if there's a little bit of confusion. If there is, it's okay, right? So if you have any questions, why that's a two-tailed test. So the key is there, you ever see this kind of, is it different than or does it differ from? That should give you identification that this is a two-tailed test where you have a not equal to sign in that alternative hypothesis. Evidence on either side of that assumed true value goes against the null, right? Above or below. So give you a little more time to work on this one because there's some computation. Work with the people around you, kind of talk through it. Maybe the person to your left or right knows something that you don't and you know something they don't. So same setup, we've got this two-tailed text, right? So if we go back to the, the previous slide, we had a not equal to sign the alternative hypothesis. That meant we had a two-tailed text. So remember, there's one additional thing we would have had to do from the previous examples, which is we can find the area on the tail, but we have to remember the two-tailed text, it was equally as likely for me to see something on the other side of the distribution. So once I find the area in the one tail, I then have to multiply it by two. So use these values, construct your Z statistic, right? Or your test statistic. Once you have that test statistic, look it up into a standard normal table and then find kind of what that probability is. And then remember we might have to multiply it by, or we're not might, have to multiply it by two at the end. 
All right, we'll go to uh three forty five here, so another twenty, twenty five seconds. All right. If we don't have an answer in, take your best guess. Got all 12 of us. All right, I'm going to close it out. So we found. We're trying to look for our So what is. Our assumed true value we said was 606 at $606. So if that in fact is the true mean, 40 cents, then our sample mean should be normally distributed out. We then look at the sample mean value that we found, 622.85. So our what we're trying to kind of find is this area to the right. So what we need to do is turn this into a Z statistic. We can then look up that Z statistic, find the area to the right. Well, we look it up first. The table tells us the area to the left. We subtract that from one and they give us the area to the right. However, this is only half of my p-value. Right? Because it would have been equally as likely for me to see something that was this far away from that assumed true value on the other side. So every kind of value in this range has a counterpart. So once I find the area of this tail, and then need to multiply it by two. Yeah. Wait, why do you subtract it from one? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so yeah. So we plug everything in. What did we get? What was the variance? 4,000 something. So, what did we get for the Z value? Right? What did you guys get for the Z statistic? I was it? 1.38. Right? So, if I look that up on my standard normal table, the table always tells me the area to the left. Right? So, if I look up 1.38 in the table, I get uh, the table tells me the area to the left. So what is that area? Probably 0.9177. Right. So remember, originally what I was doing, right? Whatever value I find, I guess one way to think about it, it doesn't matter if I'm doing a left, a right, or a two-tail test, whatever sample mean value I find, I'm looking for the area, like plot it and then draw like an arrow into that tail, right? So if I see a sample mean over here, I'm going into that right tail, right? If I see a sample mean down here for a two tail test, I'm going to find the area kind of going into that left. So it's the probability I saw something as far away, as many standard deviations away from the mean as I did, or even further. Right? So it kind of depends on the direction, right? If I see a sample mean on the right hand side, seeing something that is this many standard deviations away or even further is going off into that right tail. If I see a sample mean that's below that assumed true value for a two tail test, I said, okay, what's the problem? I saw something this many standard deviations or further, right? If it's negative, that means kind of going you know, more negative, right? Or going less. If it's positive, it means kind of going off in the right. So, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, once we look it up in the table, once we get the Z statistic, the table always tells me the area to the left. So, I need to multiply, or sorry, I need to subtract it from one. Then, once I have that value, I can multiply by two. Yeah. Can that value ever be over one? Um, okay. So what's what's the definition, right? 
definition of the p-value is it's the probability that I saw something as far away from that sample or assumed for me as I did or even further. So if it's representing a probability, no, it has to be between zero. I said I don't know. I didn't mean like I, yeah. I knew, but I'm at, let's think through kind of like whether why we can determine if it's not. Well, it's a good question. We're thinking about that those bounds, like we want to start thinking like we're looking for probabilities like these. These have to be between zero. So our test statistics quite often those are going to be you know one point something, two point something, but yeah, a few values will always be less than one if they're not. You probably made a mistake. So like in this one, if you forgot to subtract this from one and you multiplied it by two, well then you said, oh, I, I did something wrong. Oh, I forgot to subtract it from one first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so. Yeah, sometimes I'm mean with the, the false answers here. But we could, you know, we've now seen examples of a left, a right, and now a two-tailed test. Okay. Where are we at? So we've done one of every type. If I can do hypothesis testing for sample means, I can probably also do hypothesis testing for sample reporting. Right? It's going to be very, very similar procedure. Right, very similar in the way we approach them. This will be one slight difference, which is that well, we're dealing with the standard deviation of our sample proportions, and we're dealing with sample proportion values instead of sample means. But other than that, there's not a whole lot that's kind of different. So, oh, I, I, I probably should have done this one. I thought I was jumping into proportion learning. I did want to mention something here. You know, just because I'm setting one alpha, like in these problems, the really the reason why we like hypothesis testing is because once I come up with my p value. I can do hypothesis tests at a ton of different alphas very quickly. All I'm doing is because nothing else changes except for alpha. So all I can be doing is comparing that p-value to my different, different alphas. So here, you know, I have to do 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, so what, 80, 90, and 99% confidence, right? Or usually we, I, I, I am bad about calling this confidence level, like saying this with 95. Really what we typically say is I can reject it at the, 20, 10, 1% significance levels. Okay. Well, you can go through really quickly, right? So after that first example, I could reject at the 20 and 10% significance level, but not at the one. For the second example, I could reject at the 20% significance level, but not at the 10 or the 1% level. Okay, so I can do kind of several different, different checks here. Uh, Anything else I want to say? So we can do this for proportions. So we've got Friday. So let me think about. So I put the next Excel assignment up there. And I know that our exam was technically going to be, I think, set for next Friday. I'm going to push that to the following Wednesday. So November 10th, um, I believe is the date. I'll put an announcement up on Canvas about that. Um, that Excel assignment is going to cover how we do hypothesis testing in Excel. Uh, I think we'll save that for Friday. So we'll do a lot of Excel work on Friday and we'll kind of finish up doing these proportions today. And that way Friday, I can show you how to do, you no know, uh, use Excel to do some pretty interesting stuff with uh, hypothesis testing for both types of examples. So instead of kind of like switching back and forth, we'll do it all on Friday. So really with the proportions, nothing's gonna change other than like we're having an assumed true proportion now instead of an assumed for me. But everything else is going to look exactly the same. It's just the notation changes a little bit here. Okay? So we still have a greater than or right tail test, either a greater than sign of the alternative, less than or left tail test, and then a not equal to or two tail test. Same, same three types of tests, right? Two of them are one sided, the other's two. If it was a two sided test, like we just worked through the previous example, we have to find the p value a little bit differently because we have to multiply the area of the one tail by, by two because we've got kind of we got um, we have two tails. We have an area on each side now. So the steps look no different. The only difference is coming from that to these. So I'll kind of point these differences out a little bit more in depth over here. So remember these z statistics for our sample mean. And we can also come up with them for our sample proportion. 
all we're really doing is taking the statistic we're interested in, subtracting the assumed true value of that, um, sorry, the assumed true population value of that statistic, and dividing by the standard deviation of that statistic, right? It's just that here, we have a slightly different equation for our standard deviation of our sample means than we do for our sample proportion. So with confidence intervals, we were doing something like this, right? So it's going to change a little bit for proportions from confidence intervals to hypothesis testing because we no longer are going to use an estimate for what that population portion is, because now we have assumed that it's equal to some value, right? So now the way we determine that standard deviation of our sample proportions, well, that is going to be influenced by what we assume the true population proportion to be. So that's why now we're using that assumed true proportion denominator there to kind of calculate that standard deviation of our sample. questions on that. Other than that, it's really the same process. Um, but what I'm going to introduce today and kind of finish up on Friday before we go into the Excel a little bit more is we have our p-value approach, but we also have the critical value approach. So my critical value approach, and, um, as we'll, we'll kind of show you now, but don't get it confused. Just because I'm showing you critical values, the critical value approach with Proportions, you could use the critical value approach with sample means, and you can use the p value approach with proportions. It's just that I'm combining these two, that just happens the way I combine. So we'll work through uh, plenty of examples next week where we kind of see that in practice, but yeah, just don't want to get that to be confused. I could use the p value or critical value approach with proportions. I'm just going to show you how to do the critical value approach using the proportion examples. And I kind of already mentioned that. You know, now, now we don't have to do our estimate. We've got the assumed true value. So what the critical value approach is going to do is it's going to say, so you've got your assumed true proportion, and you're going to see some sample proportion there. What the critical value approach does is say, look, we know, and I'll use the right tail test here that for the standard normal distribution, there is some cutoff value or some critical value that I could look up that would give me whatever my desired alpha is in the tail. So let's say I want to set alpha the threshold at 0 0.05. I could use the inverse process using that standard normal table and find the Z value that would give me whatever that desired alpha in the tail is, right? We've done this, we've already done this, right? It's kind of what we did with like uh, confidence intervals, right? Like we were kind of using that inverse, inverse process. So what I know is that um, there would be, so there's gonna be some cutoff Z value such that if I see anything past that point, it will automatically have a Z statistic that is somewhere in this range. So I find this Z value and say like it's two. So I know that if I see a sample proportion that's more than two standard deviations away from my assumed true proportion, that's gonna be past that threshold that I set for alpha. So any test statistic that I, I see kind of past that point, I would say that it's, I'm gonna reject it. Because, um, I wanna think about how to say this real quick. So I set alpha to be 0 0.05. So I know that the probability of seeing something, and I think I'm going to call these numbers, but this would be uh, 1.645. So if I see a sample proportion that's more than 1.645 standard deviations away from what I assume to be true, I know that that probability of seeing something even further away than that is going to be less than 0 0.05. So you kind of see, I'll line up a little bit more next class, but you can kind of see how this is related to p-values, right? Because what this is telling me is I'm going to set the threshold such that anything past this number of standard deviations away from the assumed true value, the probability of seeing something more than this number of standard deviations away is going to be less than 
this threshold that I set, this type one error. So then what I do is once I have this critical value set, if I see a test statistic anywhere to the right of it, what that's telling me is I saw something that's more standard deviations away than the threshold standard deviation that I set. Right? And so I'm okay rejecting the norm. I said that, you know, anything that's less than 1.645 standard deviations away from the assumed true value, not strong enough evidence to reject the norm. If I see any sample evidence that's more than 1.645 standard deviations away from the assumed true value, that's strong enough evidence for me to then reject that. Because I know as I go more standard deviations out away from that value, it just becomes less and less likely that I would have seen that if in fact what I assumed to be true was true. So I think that I'll kind of skip this slide and show you. Oh, I thought I had a picture. There it is. We'll kind of go back and we'll kind of talk more about the critical value next class and we'll teach you some examples. But I like this visual a lot. So the critical values are I drew a right tail test up on the board, right? So I'm figuring out what Z value gives me that desired alpha in the tail. Then if I see a test statistic anywhere in that region to the right, we kind of call this our rejection region. My test statistic falls anywhere in that rejection region, I reject. If it falls anywhere not in that rejection region, I fail to reject. So this is why the one slide where I had the kind of math notation, it's a little bit, there's a lot of absolute values and things going on. Because for a right tail test, if my test statistic is greater than my critical value, this is the value that gives me alpha in the tail, I should reject. But for a left tail test, it's actually if the test statistic is less than, right? Because we're dealing with negative values. So what I usually say, the terminology I'll start using is, if our test statistic is more extreme than our critical value or greater in absolute value than our critical value. I don't know, I usually like to say more extreme because just kind of thinking about it. it doesn't matter if it's negative or positive, is the test statistic larger in magnitude than my critical value? And then for a two tail test, it's going to work a little bit differently because now I have alpha total in my tails. So alpha over two would be in each tail. So when I look up that critical value, I actually have two of them because I could see evidence on either side that would go against the null. So I have to set two critical values. And they would correspond to not having alpha in each tail, but alpha total in the tails. Okay. So we'll kind of pick up with these critical values, talk more about them on Friday. I'll work through some proportion examples, and then we'll transition to see how we do this in Excel. Okay. Uh, also, before I forget, I uh, will not.